Hey everybody, Ethan here. Today I'm going to talk about astrocytes. When I think about astrocytes, I think about a saying I heard and loved ever since. It goes, oh, he, she, they are a workhorse, not a show horse. I personally like to change this statement. I love it as is, but I usually modify it to hype up my friends and I tell them, oh, you're a workhorse and a show horse. It seems a little like a backhanded compliment to call someone a hard worker, but what? Not pretty? That's just kind of me. But I digress. Going back to the original quote, the idea here is simple, right? Some people, some horses, some things do hard work, and some other people, horses, things get shown off and get credit. And that sentiment really reminds me of astrocytes. You see, when you set the nervous system, the neurons, while it's obviously very, very important, they're like the CEO. They do one really important job, which is transmit nerve impulses, and they get all the fanfare and credit. Hell, neurons even get the entire field of neurology named after them. Meanwhile, enter the astrocyte, the real workhorse of the nervous system. Not only are they more abundant than neurons, they just flat out do more things. Look how many things they are believed to be able to do. Let's see those prima donna neurons do their jobs without the workhorse astrocytes. Spoiler alert, they won't be able to. I am, bidding, I am being, of course, very lame and facetious here, but what I hope I'm trying to get across here, what I hope is coming across, is that astrocytes, while not as well-heralded as neurons, really do have a lot of important functions. And increasingly, I think research is showing that they do a lot of important work that is critical to nervous system function. And that's sort of what we're going to hopefully be able to cover today. Speaking of hopefully covering things today, these are the questions I hopefully are going to be able to answer today. What is the function of astrocytes? How are astrocytes structured? How does it relate to their function? And what is one clinical implication of disease astrocytes? Let's start with function. And to me, astrocytes really are the Swiss army knives of the nervous system. As you saw from that Wikipedia screenshot, but now I'm going to specifically talk about certain things, they do a lot of things. I'm not going to be able to cover everything, but these are the things I'm going to try to cover. Let's start with buffering. In my callback to my first video on this channel, which I state here probably does not deserve a citation, but nonetheless, this is where it comes from. I talked about how action potentials involve repolarization seen here. Where potassium channels open, potassium rushes out of the neuron and a resting potential is reobtained. What I never really addressed though is where that potassium goes. You might just say, Ethan, who cares? It's leaving the neuron, so it matters. However, as I also covered in that same video, the driving force to push potassium out of the cell really is the concentration gradient between K plus inside versus outside. And even small fluctuations in extracellular potassium can lead to wide shifts in membrane potential and can really affect that driving force for K plus to leave the cell, which can cause hyperexcitability. Let's think about it. Without a strong gradient to tell potassium to leave, it won't. And this action potential will not really repolarize, or at least won't repolarize as effectively, causing hyperexcitability. Enter our buddy, the astrocyte. Astrocytes transport K plus out of the neuronal extracellular space, and with their sort of extensive networks, are able to buffer K plus in the nervous system. This buffering ability is not limited to potassium. They've also been studied to buffer CO2 because they possess carbonic anhydrase. If you remember from your chemistry classes, carbonic anhydrase helps facilitate the conversion of CO2 and H2O into H2CO3, which can then be converted to bicarb and H plus. And with this and their ability to move water via aquaporins and their ability to move H plus allows them to do pH buffer as well. So basically, in short, astrocytes buffer a lot of things from the neuron, which is important to sort of maintain that homeostatic balance, which the neuron needs to work properly. Speaking of working properly, let's talk about neurotransmitter recycling. One of the neuron's key jobs after it transmits that action potential down the axon is to really facilitate neurotransmitter release right into that synaptic cleft. Once those neurotransmitters are released, they can sort of bind to channels or receptors on the postsynaptic neuron to trigger some kind of inhibitory or excitatory response. However, as important as it is to make sure the neurotransmitter gets in the cleft and gets the postsynaptic neuron, it's also pretty darn important that once it binds, we're able to get it out of there. Because like an annoying alarm clock, if you don't shut off this process, it's going to keep going. If the neurotransmitter isn't taken out, it's going to keep triggering that desired or that intended response, that characteristic response in that postsynaptic neuron. And that sort of taking out function really is accomplished by the astrocyte. Because the astrocyte has all these transporters, four different neurotransmitters. It's able to sort of clear that synaptic space. And then once cleared, it actually can recycle those neurotransmitters, convert them into reusable forms for the neurons. So you really get those two functions there, which is really great for the nervous system function. 
Next up, Blood Brain Barrier, BBB, and Vasculature. In terms of Blood Brain Barrier, I have to admit, uh, my limited research tells me this is somewhat controversial, but at the same time, increasing research points to a role for astrocytes to play in the blood-brain barrier. Recall that the blood-brain barrier prevents diffusion of material between the blood, seen here, and the brain, kind of in the name, right? But that's a really tough job because the brain has these very high oxygen demands, a lot of blood flow goes in there, so it's a lot of filtration that really a strong filter is necessary to provide is provided by that blood brain barrier. It's tough. A lot of blood is going in there. Astrocytes, while not comprising the key role that the endothelial cells and their tight junctions play, play a sort of supportive role in terms of this blood brain barrier by helping maintain and modulate the barrier properties of the endothelial cells that really actually do the heavy lifting of that blood brain barrier. Less controversially, though, um, the astrocytes also help modulate vasodilation and vasoconstriction at the arterioles and capillaries to help regulate the very, very critical blood flow that is needed to assist and facilitate neuronal activity. So again, as you can see here, the astrocytes are very closely associated in space with all these vasculature, which allows them to play that, of course, modulatory role, modulatory role for the blood-brain barrier in those endothelial cells, but also help modulate vasoconstriction and vasodilation to get blood flow to where it needs to do needs to be to facilitate neuronal activity. Next up, I wanna talk about repair and inflammation. Astrocytes do play a very critical role in nervous system repair and inflammation. They really do respond to cytokines and chemokines that promote and downregulate inflammatory processes. And these astrocytes can actually themselves modulate the brain's immune response by secreting chemokines of their own. One of the responses that these astrocytes can have to sort of inflammatory triggers or inflammatory chemokines, cytokines, is seen here. It's known as astrogliosis. In astrogliosis, astrocytes become reactive, and they form these large fibrous scars called glial scars that can wall off damaged neural tissue. In addition to this sort of damage containment from the formation of these glial scars, astrocytes also secrete these growth promoting factors that can assist in the regrowth of damaged axons. So think immune function, inflammation, and also repair. Next up, metabolic roles. The astrocyte really plays an important role to address, as I mentioned earlier, the very high demands that the nervous system and neurons place on the body in terms of blood and energy, right? There's a lot of big demands that neurons have for blood, oxygen, and energy. And who steps in to sort of help supply these demands specifically for energy? That's right, the workhorse astrocyte. That was an unintentional rhyme there. Okay. <laughs> so, okay, distractions aside, we have to first remember the connections that the astrocytes possess with the vasculature, as mentioned previously, give them the ability to shuttle glucose from the blood to neurons, which makes sense just based on where the astrocytes are, obviously very close to the blood. Additionally, astrocytes contain glycogen and can initiate gluconeogenesis, allowing them to supply neuronal energy demands that way as well. Additionally, it's believed that um, these astrocytes can produce lactate from glycogen, and that's also believed to be able to be a potential another fuel source for neurons as well. Last up, other stuff. There's a lot more stuff I didn't cover here, just as sort of a, a taste of that. Astrocytes are believed to play a role in circadian rhythms, two microenvironments, myelination, seizure generation, and more. I hope what this, all these studies show, as well as my copious use of it is believed, controversial, et cetera, is that astrocytes really are the subject of intensive research now. That is bearing fruit now as well. And I really think it's possible that in a few years, we will realize that astrocytes are even more impressive workhorses than we already think now. So that's function. Let's talk now about structure. Uh, if you couldn't tell from the prefix astro and astrocyte, astrocytes are named because their many, their many spindly foot processes somewhat resemble stars. I'll be honest, this doesn't look really like a star to me. It's a little too elongated and mangled, but, you know, scientists are not the best at naming things anyway, so... But I digress. Uh, if you squint, though, you might see red around these spindly foot processes, and those red sort of this red haze around those yellow foot processes is corresponding to GFAP or glial fibrillary acidic protein. GFAP marks the astrocytic foot processes seen here that contribute to that sort of star shape. But critically, the GFAP that is seen here, its structure at least, the GFAP allows the astrocyte to affect and act 
on the surrounding neural vasculature. As my biology teachers always told me, structure determines function. This is a prime example, right? The spindly foot processes allow for the astrocyte to come in contact with a lot of neural vasculature, and the GFAP gives the astrocyte the ability to act on the vessels that those foot processes are in contact with. There are many types of astrocytes with specific functionality for each, but this video is long enough. I'm not going to really go into that. In terms of how these astrocytes are situated, though, in terms of the nervous system and neurons, this is a really cool picture of a mouse cortex, which shows how intimately astrocytes are associated with neurons. So in this picture here, red is neurons, green, you can see here these little green dots, those are astrocytes. And what this shows is that those green astrocytes, those red neurons, are very closely associated in space, which really helps explain and facilitate the many functions that astrocytes have on neuron function, right? Astrocytes so close to neurons makes sense why astrocytes help supply neurons' metabolic demands. It makes sense how they can help take neurotransmitters out of synaptic space because they're so close in space. Lastly, astrocytes and disease. Astrocytes really have been studied to contribute to a lot of different neurological diseases, but I'm really only going to focus on one, right? It's clear that astrocytes have a lot of critical functions in the nervous system, and it really does stand to reason that this pathological astrocyte activity would have a similarly pretty bad effect on the body. And again, like I just said, we're going to leave a lot of stuff uncovered. I'm going to focus only on one disease, which is multiple sclerosis. Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune disease where the body's own immune system attacks myelin sheath covering CNS neurons. Remember, myelin and that myelin sheath is critical for insulating those axons and allowing for proper propagation of action potentials. So attacking and destroying that myelin is obviously very harmful for nervous system function. The symptoms I've seen here can be very wide and varied, and the disease is the most common autoimmune nervous system disorder. The name multiple sclerosis comes from the multiple lesions, specifically that end up becoming glial scars that develop on the myelinated nervous tissue as a result of that autoimmune-mediated attack as a result of this disease. Recall that term I just said, glial scars. Wait a second, you've heard that before. You've heard that when I talked about astrocytes' role in repair and inflammation. Remember that when astrocytes turn into reactive astrocytes as part of astrogliosis, seen here on the right, they generally form glial scars to cordon off damaged tissues. So right there, that's connection, right? Glial scars in multiple sclerosis. Wait, what forms glial scars? Those astrocytes. However, current research recognizes that astrocytes don't only form those characteristic glial scars for MS, but help form the lesions that lead the formation of those very glial scars. Astrocytes are believed to uptake damaged myelin after that immune damage, which then activates those astrocytes and that activation of astrocytes, apart from just those astrogliosis and formation of glial scars, allows the astrocyte to secrete chemokines that cause an influx of leukocytes to further the immune-mediated damage that is a part of multiple sclerosis. Obviously, this is a gross oversimplification I'm giving you. More research is being done and it's necessary, but I hope this really makes clear that astrocytes play a key role in the nervous system. Like I said, they have so many functions, and obviously it makes sense that if those functions misfire, it allows them to contribute, unfortunately, to a number of neurological disease states. So what did I talk about today? What questions have I allegedly answered? First, what is the function of astrocytes? There's a lot of functions. They help buffer. They recycle neurotransmitters. They interact with the vasculature and help modulate the blood-brain blood -brain barrier. They play a key role in inflammation and repair in the brain, and they also help fulfill the very high metabolic demands of neurons. In terms of structure, how does it relate to their function? They really have these elongated foot processes that connect them to a lot of um, vessels in and around neurons. And they also, these astrocytes, are closely associated with neurons. And both of these structural qualities allow for astrocytes to very closely affect both neuron and neurovasculature function. Lastly, what is one clinical implication of disease astrocytes? In multiple sclerosis, you have these pathologic astrocytes as they uptake myelin, they further the immune damage of myelin um, by recruiting more immune cells in response to the uptake of that myelin, which causes, again, more immune-mated damage to that myelin. They also form those characteristic glial scars that are seen in multiple sclerosis via astrogeosis. So that's all I have for you today. I hope that was at least somewhat informative, somewhat interesting, and maybe a little entertaining. These are the references I have for you. Take care. Hope this was useful. Have a good one. Bye-bye.